This is the Rit Nerds Podcast, episode number seven, with your host tonight, Ron Burgess Jr., Nathan Pocock, and myself, Jim Kenny. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and uh, yeah, let's get this thing going. Um, Ron, what are you drinking tonight? A uh, little paps and a little monkey shoulder. Oh, monkey shoulder. Speaking yeah. of that, so I'm, I got a little bit of bullet bourbon here. But uh, nice. my buddy dropped off a bottle. He did a porch delivery of some monkey shoulder uh, yeah. the other day. How is it? I love some monkey shoulder. Um, but if you ever get your chance, get, go to the liquor store and see if you can find it. It's, um, it's whiskey by Virginia Distilleries. I'll send it to you yeah, um, through Instagram. All right. They have some smooth whiskey. Yeah. Yeah, really, really good stuff. Sweet. I'll um, take a look at that. So, Nathan, yeah, what, I wanna... do you, what do you got going on over there? What are you drinking? I just finished the smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are three hours behind us, so. Only seven o'clock here now. I also don't drink, so. No, I didn't no. know that. Well, no. good for you, man. <laughs> good oh, for <boy>. you. <laughs> He's That's on protein okay. shakes. Not, yeah. Not because I'm sick. No, it's just fruit, mangoes, a couple Easter eggs, some water. There you go. Nice. Throw some Reese's Pieces in there and you'll have a nice. There you go. I ran out of Reese's Pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Damn quarantines. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Well, before we go down any more rabbit holes. So, uh, Ron, what, <laughs> what's the topic you got for us tonight? So uh, um, a buddy of mine had sent me a photo of a uh, downed firefighter, and um, there was about five, maybe six firefighters around that one firefighter. Um, you know, we see this a lot in our training, especially with guys that are inexperienced, um, girls that are inexperienced. You know, how many hands can we truly put on that down firefighter? Um, I ask this sometimes, and, you know, you get – you know, there's, oh, one guy should be handling it. Oh, you know, well, he, we got to convert. We got to give him air. We got to check this. We got to check that. And um, the answer is always very. So I'm really interested to see what you guys think about uh, how many hands can really attack a down firefighter at one time where everything is proficient, if you will. Um, one of the biggest things I see a lot is when somebody goes, we need to correct his air. All right, well, what do we need to correct? Does he need a uh, second stage regulator? Does he need a hit off the UAC? Um, you know, it, things like that. And next thing you know, there's five hands on a face piece. And it's like, there's only so much real estate in, in that area to work <laughs> with. So yeah, it, it's interesting to see, you know, what people do when it's light out, lights out conditions compared to what they say they will do. So I'm just interested to see where you guys come up with. I, I I personally think too this comes into one of those things where sometimes maybe we maybe hinder ourselves with training uh, on occasion where maybe we we sort of have people converting light uh, to other people are changing the air and it's like yeah well that works great on the apparatus floor on your tenth rep in the last hour but even once I black you out and just make you have to crawl through some stuff before we get there and your heart rate's pumping a little bit more now it kind of all falls to shit pretty quick um and, and i think sometimes we trap ourselves with that but i'm not saying you couldn't do that in the real world but i'm saying you'd need the same three people training on a very regular basis on a very realistic conditions continually in order to successfully be able to operate all three of those things all at once with all three hands on uh, I, it's different for us too. Like our crews change a lot on my job and a lot of jobs around here. You don't get assigned to a hall into a rig. Like uh, a lot of departments I know to do down there for your extended period of time or career, you get moved around quite a lot. Um, so you don't necessarily get to gel with each other that, as well as you could down there, I think. But I mean, it's always going to come down to, again, one of Jim's favorites is condition strategy tactics, but 
when it comes to pack chain for me, when it comes to that SCBA conversion, oh, there you go. When it comes to that <laughs> SCBA conversion, I personally like it's that communication. I like to tell everybody back off. I've got yeah. it. I don't, I want to be the only person anywhere near that person. I don't need it. Rooms are crowded and full of enough stuff of clothes and furniture. Hey, I found them. I'm converting this harness. Hold with me. I'm going to convert that harness. All right, I've converted the harness. Now, if we want to have a two person drag or it's really heavy, we need three people on it. Um, if we're changing a face piece, that's not a one person job. But again, it's if there's four or five of us in the room or whatever it is, only two of us are going to be touching them. The officer can step back and watch with the tick. But hey, Ron, I need you to sit them up. You're going to be in charge of getting the face piece up. I mean, and I think those positions become important. We've talked about that before. I'm the air guy on this RIP team. So if this guy needs air, I'm the one doing it. Right. Right. It's not every, anybody could just grab the RIP bag and go. No, no. We knew coming into this that Nathan was the RIP guy, uh, RIP air guy. He's doing air. Ron was the tool man or the search, search guy on the team. Well, he's doing the packaging. Right. And if Jim's the officer, Jim's overseeing it with the tech and he's making sure it's all happening. Like we knew that coming into the room when we before we even found the guy. So there's none of that time to have to have that conversation for us to panic and all three of us jump on the guy because we're all just trying to get it done. Right? Yeah. Yep. I think uh, you know, Jocko says it best with uh discipline discipline equals freedom. Um as you guys are talking, I was kind of going through my my quick thoughts on this because it's really a question up until, Ron, you brought it up earlier today. I don't remember ever really being asked that or, or that topic coming up um, during RIT classes that I've, I've both, uh, you know, taken as I came up through the fire service or have uh, started to teach. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> one of the questions I, I follow up questions that I've had, I have in my head is like, you know, everyone in my world strives to have a four person writ team. Um, and for us that our, our initial writ is an engine. So that means taking your driver with you. And I'll be honest, I honestly, I like to leave my driver at the rig and tell them like, look, your job as the RIT team driver is to make sure that we have two water supplies. So that's your job to ensure that the RIT is able to do our job later on. Um, and, and again, going back to what you said, Nathan, and my favorite saying conditions drive tactics, right? Every call is going to be a little different. And I guess in my head, when I think of a typical RIT, I'm looking at a garden, a smaller garden apartment or a townhouse or a single family. Um, you know, we've been taught through our ICS training and stuff. Our typical span of control is three to seven with an optimum of five. But when you have zero visibility, your span of control shrinks. You know, you guys, when you're in that position on a, as an officer on whatever type of crew in zero viz, when you're trying to manage three other people in zero viz, it's not easy because you wander a little ways in either direction and all of a sudden you lose contact with them and they could be going down the opposite way of a high rise hallway and, and you guys each travel five to 10 feet and you could be 20 feet apart all of a sudden because of one small little mistake there. Um, so trying not to, I guess, trying to extricate myself from that rabbit hole. Um, I like to have three people uh, on my writ. If we have the fourth, it's, it's good. Um, but the discipline has to come in where if we have a full four people, most of the time, one of those people is going to be behind me, not doing anything. You know, if we're going in with a rip pack, you're bringing, they're bringing the rip pack and you're saying, Nathan, like they're the air guy, you are strictly the air guy. And what I mean by that is when we find, if we're going into your air supply mayday, the trap firefighter, and we need to supply them with air, when we find them, your job is going to be 
get the things, the equipment out of the rip bag that we need, make sure the bottle is on, make sure it's all hooked up and ready to go and hand it to the person on the firefighter that's going to apply it to them. Stay out of the way because, you know, I would say that a max number of people on that firefighter is going to max, it's going to max out around three. When you're packaging, assessing and packaging and preparing for moving, in my thoughts right now, I would say three people is your max. That's six hands on them. Um, and that would be with one person stabilizing them in a, in a position, you know, a seated position to get them off their bottle. It's one of my most frustrating things is to watch people try and flip a firefighter over their bottle. <laughs> and that just comes from habit because all of our EMS calls, when we work with an unconscious patient, we roll them out onto their back. And right. we do that way more than we do it to an unconscious firefighter with a bottle. So like you said, Nathan, that stressful in environment or situation pops up and we revert back to that because of how our brains work. And if we haven't been training in that stressful situation, we're going to do what we do all the time. So get them in that semi-seated position so you can have access to all the things you do, get their head off the ground a little bit. That person is not so much out of the game, but they become that seated person just stabilizing the firefighter. And then if you really have the room, you can now get two other people doing different things on them. One uh, converting the harness while one may be working with air. But that's a max, you know. Typically, I would say what you guys are saying, two firefighters, one behind stabilizing and, and getting, you know, checking the bottle, making sure they're breathing, doing that assessment. And then the other firefighter doing the conversion, the officers step back out of the way with the tick and their job at that point is making the communications and, and coming up with the extrication plan um, and then relaying it to them. For me, I look at it from two different perspectives. Um, at, you know, as people talk about, Fire, you know, firefighters are running in and it's chaos. Well, it's controlled chaos because we all have a job. And if we're not following through on that job, uh, there is no control to that chaos, obviously. Um, when we give students, especially lieutenants, captains, or other officers, their role, we look at it from two perspectives. We want to make sure they're doing their job and following through with what they need to do and not getting into deep on their own. Um, this is why you have a team, you know, obviously, yeah, down the road while you're moving the patient or if things aren't going correct, you need to step in to take charge, but you need to also control those people. For me at home, we try to get a six man writ team, um, if we can, and trying to keep those other three to four guys to not do anything is probably one of the hardest jobs for that officer. Uh, and it's interesting to see because everybody wants to do something. Um, well, real quick, ahead, Ron, with that larger team, do you guys ever break into two smaller teams where only half the team's going to deploy at once to do the recon, and then the second half is outside with whatever equipment you may need further down the road? So we've never actually done that. Um, our how should I say this? Our team is being like redeveloped, if you will. And a lot of our guys that were um, had some years on and were on the team and very, very strong in their positions, they've since moved away or got other careers and, and whatnot. So we have a bunch of younger guys that we are working on. Um, but we have had it where we stage guys in the hallway or somewhere you know, in the vicinity, um, we never really have guys outside. Um, it is a new thing that we're, we haven't tossed around yet, but we need to toss around after especially talking to you guys and some people online, you know, understanding that sometimes more is less, you know? Yeah. So. Well, it, but you think about that, it you, in, and again, it comes down to what type of structure are you in, right? You know, if you're in a right. house or smaller structure, if all they're doing is sitting inside wasting air out of their bottle, yep. then they're not a a helping anybody. Whereas if they're out of the IDLH and they're not breathing the air on their back and they're listening to what's happening on the radio, 
you're, you're inside communicating back to them. When you hit your next problem, they're hopefully that backup team right away to come in and help you out. Right. Exactly. Um, now that I'm thinking back about it, we have had larger buildings or homes that we have split the team into. A, um, not necessarily like, Hey, we have two rip packs, but Hey, if the, this group is going in, these are going to be my first guys. And then in the meantime, usually we have other guys throwing ladders or doing other things that are proactive on the fire ground. Um, but back to that officer inside, um, controlling those guys behind you or your crew members behind you is one of the biggest keys, you know, having that, that real estate of that, you know, let's say an AV 3000 for Scott, you know, there's only so much room to work there and, you know, making sure those two guys or, or two crew members are doing their jobs, you know, to where they need to be. It, it's a hard task for officers to focus. Um, then on the flip side, being the firefighters, you need to understand that like you have your role. That's, that's your job. Um, I'm definitely a big fan of obviously make shit happen as you guys know. Um, but if I'm the rope person on my team or even the extrication, you know, I could be looking for a second means of egress while, while a conversion or an air problem is being fixed. Um, so we need to be proactive. I think not just standing there wasting air, like you were talking about in the IDLH. But I, I think it goes as far as you're not just, not that you're necessarily maybe even standing there wasting air. You're, you might be there conserving air, depending on, again, I mean, there's so many what ifs and theoreticals. Let's say you've gone <laughs> so far in, your, your guys up ahead right now might be wasting a shit ton of air, extricating the guy out of collapse and getting them ready. So yep. it's going to be up to you to actually just chill out and save your bottle because you're going to be the guy that has to drag them out because now you're going to be huffing and puffing so that the guys working hard right now don't run out of air. It, right. It, I think it, it goes back to something that I always harp on is like, Rip teams can't be a blase thing uh, that many of us are guilty of doing in our departments. Like the communication that we need in those environments is huge. Like to, to organize that and understanding all the roles. I, I always think it's funny when you get some officers that don't want firemen to understand, like don't want almost like close the door if they're doing tabletop. Like, oh, you don't, you don't need to know this yet. Or this is, this is too much for you. And it's like, you know what? Yeah, I don't need to know it yet. Let's say I'm a probationer. I don't need to know it for 20 something years on my job before you're, you're allowed to actually be an officer. But for me to know a little bit of what you're trying to do, now when I'm that fireman sitting there antsy to just get shit done, at least I understand a little bit that, you know what, the best thing I can do right now is just make sure my officer in charge right now knows where I am and then I'm ready to do this. Because the worst thing I can do to that guy is run off and start doing stuff, right? I know how much stuff he's got on his plate right now to keep control of because I actually have a sense of what he's going through, right? Whereas if we try and protect that knowledge for whatever reason to yeah. only be for the select few, well, now all I know is that He's sitting there looking for a tick camera while everybody else is working hard. So screw him. I'm going to go do my thing, right? Like that, that communication and knowledge and, and meaning, there are some departments out there that are guilty of too. Like they'll create a RIT team where the firefighters are RIT trained, but the officer isn't. Right. Because it's just his turn. He's pulled into that rig, which is a RIT trained rig, but he's not a RIT trained officer. Well, I think that's kind of setting one that crew up for failure, but that officer is being put in a pretty crappy situation too, right? Um, that it needs to be understood. But I'm kind of going on, going all over the place here. But the other thing about the hands-on that I was thinking of, what I was trying to hold back there is, besides the select few things we do in RIT, like air supplies and that, a lot of what we do in RIT is very common to what we do in firefighting, right? So when you're doing searches from a ground ladder through a window into different bedrooms 
and you're doing it with a crew of four, you don't send all four members through that window, right? Okay. You maybe send two if you're going to do a split search. But a lot of the time, if it's you're going to send one, and one just stays at the top of the ladder, right? Two stay at the bottom of the ladder, and then those two at the bottom of the ladder, I don't know how you guys work, next window, those two get to go up and in to cycle the air, right? Yep. So why would it – and we don't need all four people on that victim – in that bedroom to get them up and out the window. So what changes when we turn it into a mating? Uh, dude, I, <laughs> I'm so happy you just said that. Um, <laughs> that is a thought that I've had that exact question. What changes when we have a mayday? And, and I've been thinking that for the last at least four or five years, because one, the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple. We overcomplicate the shit out of so many things in the fire service um, when it's really just a simple job. And yes, there are some technical difficulties in the simplicity of our job, but it, it's not a hard job. If you train, it's not a hard job. Um, <clears throat> the what changes question. You know, if we're going to a fire and you're, like you said, Nathan, extinguishment and victims, those are two of the, the priorities that we have. Uh, most of the time, they're the number one and two priorities on the fire ground. Well, when we have a mayday go out, what changes? Well, we still have to accomplish extinguishment and now we have a known victim. So if we have search teams that are already inside searching for civilians, if you can, at the strategic level, start shifting them towards the Mayday because they're gonna, just like Project Mayday has shown us, they're gonna be the first ones there. They become your re recon right away, right? We don't have to get into this confined space entry type RIT um, excursion that we've all been trained on for a long time um, and, and, and just let it, flow the way that the fire ground was flowing. Keep focusing on extinguishment, start moving priorities over towards, uh, you know, we got a victim, talk to them, find out what their problem is, and let's come up with a solution for their problem. And then have the RIT team, that standby team, the specialty team, come in with the solution, right? If the, the search crew inside finds them and they're trapped, well, if the RIT team already deployed, but only deployed with an air pack, and this guy's trapped under a floor collapse and needs to be cut out, then we just wasted, a, if, we, if we deployed 30 seconds too fast without the saw that we needed, then did we really do, um, what we, you know, it was that really the best model for deployment? Whereas if we had waited another 30 seconds for that report, we, we would have brought it with us along with the air pack with maybe that extra person or that full crew of six versus only three of them. Um, I think, you know, I, I just, I like that question though, Nathan, you know, what, what really changes, obviously, you know, the people, there's going to be people that are like, Oh, a lot changes. You guys don't know what you're talking about. The stress level goes up. Well, like I get it. The stress level does go up. One of our friends is in trouble, but we're also volunteer career. We should be competent professionals that have talked through and trained through some of this. And that goes back to why I think we all agree um, that RIT training is part, should be part of whatever firefighter one training program you go through. Most of RIT should be in there, right? Yeah. Air supply stuff should be in there. How to form and deploy a RIT team should be in there. Just the basics, just that basic technical uh, the tactics of that, not, not so much the strategic level, but that way when they get put on it and that's, I'm thankful for working where I work because that's kind of how we look at it. Whereas we try and get the RIT technician level and fire ground survival training to our basic training program. Um, because that's who is on our initial RIT. Our fourth engine company is your initial RIT. And that's on some days I'm on an engine that I floated to with a driver who has three or four years in and two probationary firefighters in the back. That's my RIT team. And I may be leaving the most experienced person on that team, the driver, out to pump water and take the two red shields in with me. Um, and that's, you know, they hopefully have had 
that training. And that's why we've kind of moved to, we need to give them so much of this in recruit school so that they hit the field running, that they've had air changeover situations already. They've had face mask changeover practices. They know, they know how to assess and package a firefighter and, and, and start moving. Um, and to back even a little back up a little, a little further, Nathan, um, what you were saying about the hoarding of information, you know, that's, it is it's so frustrating because um, the why is so important and that trust that you build between the firefighters and the officers on the fire ground, there is not there. Most of the time, there is no time to answer those questions with the deep thought out. This is why I'm doing this. But as an officer, you should be making time to come back and follow up with your firefighters after the call and say, Hey, remember when I yelled at you to do this? Did you understand why I wanted you to do that? Like I told you to stay at this doorway and don't basically, you know, we know how to get, don't fucking move until I come back and get you. <laughs> and uh, like, no, why did you tell me? Okay, this is, let's have this conversation. This is what was going through my head. This is how I was seeing the situation unfold. And I wanted you to stay put one to conserve air a little bit. And two, so I knew exactly where you were because as this situation was rapidly unfolding in a bad way, I was doing the best I could to keep you in the safest environment possible. You know, if we're not, we don't have to always dedicate the entire four people onto a four that may collapse. If I can keep three out of the four in a safe area while I go out and take a look at what's happening, you know, do a little recount on my own, then if something goes bad, the whole crew doesn't go through the floor that type of deal, you know, but that, that follow up, the, the why is so important to keep that trust level there. Well, I think you, you hit on a good point, it, you know, having that discussion to that firefighter of, Hey, this is why we did this for this reason. Do you understand? And then yes or no. And obviously you move forward with a teaching moment or you don't, but in a lot of situations, what I would like to see done is for those firefighters, to be put in that officer position for that training scenario. Give them that seat. Like, hey, you're in charge. Let's make some decisions and let's figure this. So as they're going through their scenario, they're learning as they're doing it. And, you know, the next scenario, their officer asks them to do something. And they go, all right, well, this is what I expected for information or communication wise. So maybe I should communicate that to the my officer. And then hopefully that builds on it. Um, you know, obviously you don't put them in a situation where you're going to be an asshole and be like, I'm going to really stump this guy, you know, to make him feel like an idiot. But, you know, cause there's guys out there that would do that, but, you know, give them the opportunity to really think on their feet and, and, and look at the aspect of what they're looking for. Right. So if we have a down firefighter, Jim, I need to know, is it his air issues and how much air he has? All right. That seemed pretty straightforward. Right. So I expect to know if he has an air issue, how I'm going to fix the air issue and how much air he has currently. Right. So next time when I'm in that air's position and I'm asked, Hey, what's his air issues and how much air does he have? I should be on the same page of giving that, that information as fast and, you know, re relevant as possible. So I think, you know, the learning curve could come in from both angles. It's just, I don't think, uh, everybody really has an opportunity to look at both sides of the coin. And that's where some confusion comes in. And nobody's got anything. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. That's definitely agree. Um, I, I, I can't, yeah. I, I love what you guys are doing in Fairfax. Uh, I think Don Abbott's, if, if, if one of the main takeaways for me from Don Abbott's stuff is it's like you're talking about Jim we for so long I know we've talked about this before uh quite a few times when we're not recording but like for a long time we based everything off of the Phoenix study which was a great and revolutionary study but all of our writ response and training was based off of this writ team outside responding in as if nobody else is in the building um, and like Don Abbott's shown, I think we really need to start understanding that reutilizing or moving other crews inside, uh, 
could actually form and as Don Abbott shows for 93% of the May days will actually make red almost a supportive team on the outside more than anything they might do nothing other than hand tools through a window or put up a ladder at the right one when it's needed like and and that's okay that actually puts less people in harm's way less people in the building less and it makes it a faster rescue yeah right? it, uh, it, i definitely agree and uh, with every point you just made nathan and um you know, I think, like you said, the Phoenix study, it was revolutionary when it came out. And I actually spent an hour yesterday, you know, I was asking you guys last week if you had the, if you could find the actual study. I, I've yet to find the actual study, but I dug out the article um, from, where did I put it? Uh, here it is. The, from... December of 2003, rapid intervention isn't rapid. This is the article that explains the study as best as possible, and it's 16 pages long. Um, you know, that's the first real study done. So mm -hmm. all of that information was groundbreaking at the time. It was the only information available, and it was taken from a real line of duty. So that was where everyone picked up, was like, this is the deployment model we need to build. And it's still a good deployment model for that type of mayday, right? For that large area store with firefighters missing and low air, you will need to do a recon. You'll need to find them, fix the problem, and then move them out. And that's a multiple part mayday, right? And that's where that number 12 comes from. Um, the cool thing is if you look at that study and then you read Henrico's study and you read the Asheville study and you read the Fairfax study, you see one of the most important things I've picked out across all of them is that in the Phoenix study, they said one out of every five firefighters involved in the rescue was calling a mayday or had their own problem. Mm -hmm. That number has dropped in the other studies because RIT training has picked up, right? Because... <clears throat> Like when we ran our study, we had across the entire board, we ran the study, I think 40 something times I have to look at. We ran that evolution 40 something times. We had, I think, three maydays across all 40 times, three additional maydays. So what that tells me is that because we started training on RIT and, and practicing some of this stuff, we're starting to take some of those problems away. Guys are expecting that high stress they they, you know and the training may not always be perfect but it's starting to fix some of those problems but back to what you're saying you know at that point when the the study was done and that was all that was available and then for the next you know that was 2001 2002 2003 when that was all done and started to be reported on um Project Mayday didn't come out to what, 2015? So started, for the next yeah. 12 years, you had, we're only getting information from line of duty deaths. Or if a department was transparent enough to share their close call, and a lot of them aren't. So right. until Project Mayday came out, we were only looking at our failures. When you start to see Project Mayday take off over the next, you know, 2015 till present, we started to see our successes. And I was looking at one of the first PowerPoints I put together about the Fairfax study after we finished it. And uh, earlier today, as I'm getting ready for the webinar coming up in May, and I noticed that my, my uh, number of um, maydays that had been recorded through project mayday at the time that i started putting this stuff together which was 2016 it was like 1100 and right now we're over 5000 yeah true. and the percentages have stayed really close to the top three maydays that are called which are still uh you know they shuffle between the top three of who's one two and three but they're still falls through or off of a roof they're still lost firefighters and they're still falls through a floor or stairwell to the floor below they're still like those yep. are the top three concurrently over that time period even though we've gotten five times as much data now and then the other number 
that is even increasing a little more. Uh, when I wrote that study and did the PowerPoint, we were at 11% of Maydays were being rescued by the writ, and now it's dropped even more down to 7%. So by looking at that, man, it just, it's like this, uh, this information's here. We have to look at it and we have to adapt or we have to change our program to, to see what's actually happening. And then how do we make it even better? You know, um, I'm, again, I'm lucky with the resources we have. Our initial RIT is, a, is an engine company, but our RIT task force, what we call RIT level one, brings it up to 12. We get that 12. From that study, that's where that number 12 comes from that we've been striving for. Um, but we don't all 12 go in when a Mayday is called. We end up in that 12, we have two engine companies and a special service, either a truck or rescue. So that allows that RIT group leader, supervisor, chief, or whatever the, the area calls it, wherever you guys are, to make those decisions after hearing the mayday. What type of mayday do I have? I have a fire mayday. He fell through a floor into a basement, and it's on fire. I'm deploying a search team along with an engine company with a hose line to the basement right now. That's my RIT response right away. You other guys are in staging. And we're going to, you'll respond in with whatever they need to finish the job. Um, I have uh, a lost firefighter in a large commercial. Okay. We might deploy a writ, a search team from two different entrances on a, two different ropes going into the building, trying to figure it out. Um, you know, so it, it allows flexibility in the deployment model. And then as you deploy them, backfill the units from staging so that you have the personnel there to keep the situation moving forward. I think it's, I think you're right. It's just learning to recognize, like you say, but the one thing I loved about Asheville and again, comes back to you guys doing it right there in Fairfax is 1407 should just be a chapter of 1001 in my book, but they compared those writ May days to level of training of the members forming yes. the, yeah. the, the rescues. And when they just removed one technician level and replaced them with a 1001 firefighter, Maydays went from 20% to 38% for that crew. <clears throat> and, and I think Project Mayday is one in eight right now. So our real world data is one in eight, which is still pretty high. Really but, high. Uh, yeah. But again, the situations and stuff, like it's totally understandable, but like you have to have like, just it, again, it goes back to when a mayday happens, why is it any different? Like we don't search a house the same way we search a commercial building. We don't respond to fires in a house the same way we respond to fires in a commercial building. So why are we only ever trained on RIT for like that commercial building doomsday 15 firefighters at it's two different scenarios, right? And just like the ICS structure we plan all the time, you've got a smaller house, smaller mayday. Yeah, you just have a smaller group and it can expand exponentially as needed. But if we're in a high rise, a large McMansion, a commercial building, well then we need to upstaff. We need to be ready with 12 guys standing by, not four. We need to be ready to make that from 12 guys to 30 guys rotating shifts in and out. like where did the flex why are we so flexible on our everyday fires and then our flexibility is gone the minute we move into that mayday like i don't think we talk about it enough you know i, I think as uh i in one of the other slides i had in that presentation and it, i it might pop up again in the webinar is it's this unconscious bias, right? Um, and I, my, this is a class that I actually taught with Rex and um, you know, I'm in Maryland, so I can't carry a handgun because it's damn near impossible to get a carry permit. But Rex lived in Virginia when he lived here. So Virginia, you know, it's not as hard. So Rex carried, you know, like a lot of my friends do, they conceal carry. Um, and we used to talk to it about that. You know, if you're a concealed carrier, do you actually train on pulling your gun from concealment to a firing position 
you know, do you train on that? Or do you just go to the range, pop off a couple rounds and go home and say, oh, I'm good. The unconscious bias of having that gun on your hip gives you the safety that you feel like you're going to be able to handle the situation, right? So when Rick came up, like, oh, we got to do something. And this was before my time in the fire service, but oh, we got to do something. So we formed this RIT team. Okay, cool. We got a RIT team. We're ready to go. We feel safe on the fire ground because we got four members over there standing around doing nothing except for, you know, not nothing, but doing things only in preparing for if one of us goes down or gets hurt. And that's where that conversation has stopped. We got them. They're right there. There's four of them right there. Do we really need more? Well, yes, we do <laughs> if something bad happens. But like Ron, me and you have talked before, if you're in a jurisdiction where it's, you, you have manpower issues, we're not saying you need 12 firefighters to be in, on your RIT team. We're saying you need 12 firefighters who are in staging ready to work, right? right. You have 12 in staging between your four person or six person writ and another crew or not, just not, you know, not deployed yet. They're ready to work. If something bad happens, you have the resources you need to start moving them to the different areas to start solving your problems. So if you have manpower issues, we're not saying you need to have a whole bunch of members in staging plus a whole bunch of members in writ, but between the two, your goal should be to have 12 firefighters that are ready to work that are undeployed. And if you have to cycle a crew out and you send four people in to replace them, then your goal is you drop from 12 to eight, you need to get 12, four more, whether that's calling an additional alarm or cycling your, your people who came out into a new bottle and getting them ready to work again. But that 12 still plays, you know, even though a lot of things have changed, that first number, that number 12 still plays a very important role in that it's a good goal to have 12 undeployed firefighters ready to work on your fire ground. Do you think we make scenarios um, adaptable to those 12 numbers? Like, because a lot of times, you know, we send guys in, whether it's four or six man team. And, you know, usually guys come out and like, I didn't do anything. I was just there breathing air. And it's like, okay, well, maybe, you know, the scenario wasn't that hard or maybe you guys just did a good job. And we don't set ourselves up for a longer extended scenario. Yeah, I think that's probably part of it. Um... It, it, it's 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 all they're difficult to set up which is the unfortunate bit right it goes yeah. back to that instructor who doesn't want the students to cut wires in entanglement box right because oh, he just wants to get them through he doesn't want to work any harder right time uh, and money time and money time are and money. the two important things and and when it comes down to it those are the first two things that get cut yeah and, and it's hard like um and when we do our full 1407 class, we deliberately allowed uh, a full half day at the end just for scenarios. And we just get through three scenarios in that time. And, and uh, we try and kind of hit everything. One, one, we, one scenario is nice and quick. We just do it. We do it through the floor with non-conscious. Um, so a lot of people don't have that prop. They don't get time on that. And, it's, and it kind of gives me more time to set up the other one the other reason the next one we do we're trying to we try and work on what we got but in order to be able to do it in four days we keep our student class size no more than 15 students because otherwise it's got to be a six-day course like you just don't get enough reps not enough time um we send in a team as a backup team with three or four we send a fire attack team of two down into a basement and then we put a RIT team of four outside. And then that's how we start the scenario. And then we make the two down below. The minute they get the fire attack down the stairs, we grab one, tell them, your, the room just flushed. You're done. Lie down. Grab the other one, pull his reg, and tell him to call a mayday and drag him off into a corner and kind of confuse him. 
and then we see what happens. We've given them a backup line at that point that's sitting at the stop of the stairwell. And it's interesting to see as we harp on it, um, all for the three and a half days prior, there are sometimes that backup line stays at the top of the stairwell, doesn't move for the whole scenario. And Rit dives through the basement window and does everything why the backup line doesn't move. And the room flashed. It's kind of back to what you guys did in Fairfax, telling them, super hot in here. We got flashed on. We lost our hose line. I'm out of air. I don't know where the other guy is. Um, and the hose line's at the top of the stairs. The, problem's, the problem can be solved right there, right? And some guys get it instant. Boom, that hose line moves right down. And the RIT team never goes in. And, and you get that conversation with the students. They're like, I thought this was a RIT class. Like, <laughs> the, RIT team, the RIT team didn't get in the building. I, got, I, I, I wanted to be on the RIT team this time, so I wanted to do some stuff. So, well, you weren't needed. You passed your air pack into the three guys that were already on the backup line. They gave it to the other guy, and they passed you the two guys out the basement window. And that, like Job you said earlier, that, that, oh, that why moment, right? Sitting mm -hmm. down and explaining to them, like, yeah, you're in a RIT class, and yes, you didn't have to work. Do you understand why? You understand that the solution was solved with this, this problem was solved. Sorry, the solution was solved. That makes no sense. The problem was solved <laughs> by doing this. And that's a real world call. That, that rapid fire event is a real world call. Um, yeah. yeah, and it, it's incredibly intense to set up that type of training where you have to have 12 full you know, that full rotation, because you have to, you know, you have to try and, I mean, there's plenty of good scenarios to pick from where it's going to do it, but then you have to facilitate it, right? Well, and that's to our facilitate last scenario. A floor collapse. It takes some effort. It takes some effort, and it takes, you know, you know, to do it safely in a zero to very limited visibility environment, you have to have adjunct or roll – you have to have role players. You have to have standby staff with thermals to watch. You don't have to have all of it, but um, to do it safely, you have to have a good number of people and yeah. you have to have, it, it's just, it's hard to do. Our last scenario we do is the one to get multiples and I'll collect cardboard boxes from all the grocery stores in the place we're teaching for the first three days prior. And then all the drink bottles that they've all been drinking water and yeah. Gatorade. I keep all those. And then we'll build the hallway. And we just give them one in and out. Which. And then the guy. We just fill it full of cardboard. Pop bottles. String wires. And then the guy get through a wall breach. Supply air. And get them all the way back. So one of. That's a good. That's good. It oh. just gets them. Get some using. And. And. Some students are great. They'll send one crew in, and all they are is clearing wire. So they push through clearing wire. They get through, reach the wall. They start supplying air. And then the other four go in and just start fraying garbage out. They know they're coming this way. So you just got four people in there fraying garbage out while the other four are on standby. Yeah. Yep. And once that garbage is clear, the other crew runs out of air. So the one outside ends up going in to take over while they come out. And the ones spraying garbage come out, take a break, get new bottles. And that it usually works well. I, I usually have to be the patient for that one because I and I get all kinds of bruises. <laughs> but uh, I had a 280-pound guy just step on my shoulder one time. Oh nice. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. It oh, it's, yeah. Those but, are the good ones though. Those are the the thinking outside the box uh, scenarios. Um, a buddy of mine, uh, I don't know if you guys know him, but Benjamin Martin, Ben Martin runs Embrace the Resistance. He gave me an idea um, a few years ago, and we took it and put it into our RIT class. And so the scenario, like you said, Nathan, at the end of the day, it's at the end of our second or last day of the class. Um, we put two firefighters on the roof of the burn building with a chainsaw. One has a mask on, one doesn't. And as the RIT is, is we, we, put the students into two different teams. One is a four person writ and one is a two or three person search team off of a truck. Um, if we have enough people, we will put another crew in place on an engine company. But 
it gets it gets tricky at that point. And as they walk up from their rig to the fire ground, they hear and see the chainsaw running on the roof, right? And as they're talking, the first search team comes in. The IC will point to a window and say, I want you to get up over that ladder, get in that window, start searching the second floor. So they do that. And as they're searching the second floor and the RIT team is walking up to the command, you hear the chainsaw cut off. And, and then about 30 to 40 seconds later, you hear a mayday go out. And it's mayday, mayday, mayday. We fell through the roof. I don't know where my other guy is, but I'm in the attic stuck. I can't get out. It's really hot up here, right? That's the mayday. So I see redeploys the search team from the second floor to try and get up there and relay conditions back. Um, if we don't have the personnel, we put a role player on a, net, on a hose line on the stairwell like hey we already got a line here we're covering you from the stairwell we're knocking it down so you can go ahead and search if we do have people there and we can flow water we'll put more people on the line but we deck out a mannequin in full gear with an scba and a helmet but no mask on and we hoist them up into the attic space and tie them up there in wires and he gets stuck up there so one guy went all the way through through the roof into you know the whatever it, we're looking at like your um, oh like a Cape Cod is is kind of how it's designed at the burn building we were running it at so they're in that attic space sec top floor in that in that roof uh, space and the other guy is stuck up up in that area but his pass alarm is not going off because he didn't have his mask and bottle on when he was on the roof mm. cutting the hole. So it takes some extra time to find him. We have a role player playing the other Mayday victim, and they have the leeway to either help him or hurt him, depending on if they're making, if the crew's doing a really good job, they're going to make it a little bit harder for him. If the crew's doing a really bad job, they're going to help him a little bit so that they don't fail, right? So they don't have a horrible failure. Um, and then they have to locate the the firefighter up in the in the uh, stuck in the wires, cut them down, and then decide if they're going to put a mask on them or not, and then get them out. Um, and it goes a couple different directions depending on the people playing in the scenario. But yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I like to keep it simple sometimes. Where. Uh... You know, you play, somebody plays a role play of the mid firefighter or they're having an air issue. And usually you try to find the the newest member on the team or person with, you know, least amount of years, if you will. And uh, they come up to you and uh, you rip your regulator out and you grab their pair air back straps and yell at them, I need air now. And you kind of shake them a little bit and uh, you kind of see what they do, you know, whether they're going to, help you get your regulator back in or buddy breathe you or hey, eat some air off the UAC or something like that. So just to put that panic in there and, you know, flight syndrome, kick that in, see what you gear that's sitting in. Are we in low or are we in high? Yeah. It's nice when you have a nice burn building where like, like you're saying, Jim, where you could set something up like that and really go through a full scenario. Oh yeah. We so, were we were lucky being able to use the facility we had. The downside was uh, I had to buy a smoke machine and that hurt. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, so I was like, well, do you buy three semi-decent smoke machines or do you buy the good one? Right. So I spent $3,000 uh, before Whew. that class and bought a Bull X smoke machine. And man, it's unreal. Oh yeah. It's, it, it's great. Yeah. It's, it, and the cool thing was for the class, we actually used it at the same time for both scenarios in two different buildings. We would run it in one until we got it where we needed it, unplug it. And I had a, one of my guys run it over to the other building, climb up four flights of stairs, plug it in, run it for another five minutes over there, unplug <laughs> it and run it back over to the other building. And we did that for like three hours. Wow. Um, but it kept both buildings as they came in and opened doors. And it was a fairly uh, 
not windy day, but it, it was uh, in the middle of the winter. So the wind was up a little more than normal. And uh, it did a great job. I love that smoke machine. But uh, well, yeah, that one hurt for a little while. With all Nathan's bottle deposits there, you can collect all those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, I mean, obviously, you know, the hands-on question is really going to go many different ways. You know, who's in charge, what's being done, how much room we have to work, and what our team size is to start out with. Um, and, and that's going to determine a lot for the team moving forward. I, I think to keep in mind, though, is to control that chaos, keep people on their jobs, their tasks, you know, and kind of keep people at bay behind you saying, hey, we got to pay attention to what's going on, what we need to do next, and start making moves. It's like anything we do. I mean, you finish any drill, and almost always everyone will say communication, right? What yep. could we have done better? Communication. And I think in the higher the stress of a situation, the better and more clear that communication has to be. And uh, I don't envy officers at most of the time um, with how much they've got on their plate. But, but I, a RIT officer, you're going to need a good, strong officer in that role to really keep everybody in that situation running smooth and under control. And, and uh, yeah, I, I don't envy the guy that has to take that on. Um, but yeah. he, he's really going to have to keep the reins back on everybody and keep that communication good and clear, right? And everyone's got to do their part too, right? Which is back to that conversation. You, you can make it harder or easier on your officer if you're yelling and screaming and, and trying to get ahead and do stuff that's not what you're assigned to do. Then you're making his, his or her life a lot worse than if you do understand what that officer's going through, you can help him out a bit by being that silent guy, stepping back a bit, understanding when you can run your reins out a little bit more and get stuff done and do the hey cap i'm just going to be right here as opposed to just waiting to be told where to go right which comes right. from crew integrity and and getting that comfort with each other and everything but yeah that communication is going to be key communication and control for, for all that i mean i have the aspect of where during the day you know at home we may not have an officer that rides to our, our scene with us um, or shows up on scene for that fact. So, you know, having that senior guy, if you will, or somebody with a little more experience to be put in that position to make those calls, you know, I think that's why everybody needs to be very well rounded in their positions. Um, whether it's from, you know, setting up a high point outside to throwing a ladder to the high point outside. Um, you know, you, you need well-rounded firefighters, in your response crew, um, those well-rounded firefighters will go back to what you guys were talking about before is people inside doing most of the work before the RIT team is being even deployed. So having that skill set build upon in training, well, obviously, well, it should affect a better outcome if they're alone inside when somebody goes down near them. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, like every other conversation we've had, we start off with a one small thing and it goes down, conversation takes off. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, in order to be good at your strategies, you have to be good at tactics, right? If you're not good at tactics, you could have the best strategy in the world, but you're not going to accomplish it. So, you know, keeping the all people on the, on your writ, uh capable right keeping them all trained up whether it's the officer or the firefighters because like you said both of you guys um you're both right you know the officer yeah because they're the they're the formal leader but sometimes they're not sometimes you have a flaky officer who is not you need to have that next person on the team who can step up and start making those decisions when they see that there's not any being made and then two like you said, Ron, you know, it's not necessarily the officer per se, the person in with the, with the white shield or whatever. It's the person who's in charge, the person, whatever rank they hold, it's the leader, formal or informal of that team. 
that is making those decisions or lending the guidance to the decision maker to say, hey, I think we should do this. And then that's the decision that they make. Um, the keys and to that, me are, sorry, go ahead. And that's okay though. I, oh I think yeah. The first, some people in the first year is, <clears throat> fire service need to realize that like there's not strong officers out there, but there's, they're strong in the sense of they know their guys' skill sets, you know, so they could lean on those guys to do the right thing or uh, get feedback from them and, and build upon that, you know, and, and that's awesome to see, you know, not everybody in the fire service is going to be that go get them, suck them, knock them, you know, officer. And, and, and that's okay. Um, I think we need to understand our, our abilities, you know, we all don't have the greatest abilities in every aspect that we do. So. Absolutely. Um, I would say the keys for me, man, are, one is discipline, discipline in your roles, and then having a plan, communicating your plan and being flexible in your plan. Yep. Um, and thinking through keeping your brain engaged in the fight, whatever it is, whatever role you have on the fire ground, keep your brain engaged and think through what's happening and make decisions. Um, but yeah, as for the hands on it, you know, through those things, you're going to be able to, uh, limit in a good way, the number of people clawing over that firefighter, keep it from all six people to two or three. And, and they understand why, and they have the discipline to be able to do that. Right. And that's, that's, again, it's training train them more you need to have that confidence and comfort that when ron says he's packaging i know i get a 10 second break because ron's gonna package them and when he says he's done he's done i don't need to be worried about what's happening or how it's happening i don't need my hands on it i just need to know hey that guy bill steve whoever just told me they're doing it perfect it'll be done soon and off we go and likewise i need to be able to say I'm packaging, hold off, and I don't need that guy going, are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done yet? No, I'm not. Stand by. Like, right? Yeah. yeah. It's like your chief calling in. What's your status update? Chief, it was two seconds ago. I'll give you a status update when we have one. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it goes out. You know, when, when chiefs don't train with their guys, it, it happens a lot on the radio, and they keep calling and keep calling. And, um you know, I don't know what you guys have seen, but, you know, sometimes the guys just, they don't answer them anymore because they can't handle it, you know. Not that they can't handle it. It's just they need to focus on doing other things and getting other things taken care of. Yeah. You, well, when you're getting called that often, you're being turned into a communicator versus a doer. You're spending yeah. all your time just relaying information while the communication is extremely important. When you're inside the IDLH, there's not there's no room. We don't have the luxury to just be communicators. We have to be doers and communicators. And if all your time is going into pushing pushing the push to talk button and and trying to listen to it all, you know, then you're not doing anything. You're just confined you're, space is a perfect <clears throat> example of that. <clears throat> Stuck in a tube all by yourself, sweating your nuts off with a hose dangling between your legs and ropes for trying to package a guy in a 20 inch tube to haul him out and everyone outside is asking you what's going on and who's doing what it's just like, i'm trying not to yell right now let's just <laughs> uh, i don't have you know, any experience in that but uh i and that's it's all yours you can have those confined space calls <laughs> <laughs> Uh, tech rescue you know, th that. thinking about it a little more it's it, it's coming back to uh you know trust in your crew you know trusting that they're able to get their task done um you know you, you talk to some people and they have to micromanage and that's just their style and i get it but like you can only hold the leash for so long especially in the dark you can't really see where that leash is going so you got to trust in your crew to, that they're going to get the job done. And if they can't, that they could say, Hey, I need help. And, and to go back to, we just keep going in circles, but to, to go back, you build, <laughs> you build, well, and it's all accurate though. You, you go, you build that trust through training, just like Nathan said, you build yeah. that trust through that shared time 
working together in those environments. And I think that's a good place to uh, cut this, this conversation off. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think my wife and the newborn are calling my name from the other room right now. Understood. Yeah. But uh my newborn is hella advanced to already be calling in. <laughs> well he's he's making noise. <laughs> he's got yeah. a tiny quill pitches already. So yeah. <laughs> that's next week. Homeschool, man. Next Homeschool. <laughs> Fellas, like always, it's good to hang out and see you guys and uh have some good discussions. Uh to all the listeners. We hope you enjoyed tonight. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to episode 7 of the Rit Nerds podcast. We hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll be dropping a few more episodes shortly. Thanks for your patience. I know it's been a few months since we've had a new episode up. Um, Sorry about that. Life just gets in the way sometimes. Thanks for your support, and we'll see you on the next one.